speaker is Dr. Phil Blevins, Southern historian, Southern patriot, president of Graham Bible College in Bristol, Tennessee. I've known Dr. Blevins for a long time. I've heard him speak numerous times, both in sermons at church and in events like this at RSCV camp and others. I know y'all are going to enjoy it, Dr. Blevins. Yeah. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's an appropriate way to greet all of you here tonight. Amen. I want to thank our dear friend and brother Bill Holly for giving me this opportunity along with the Sons of Confederate Veterans. It's always a joy to talk about Dixie, the standards of what we believe, our history, and those things which we love as the people of God in this part of the country. So thank you for the opportunity of being here. And may God bless you in your work and continue to move forward with this because I do believe it is in a real sense of ministry, opening the eyes of people who cannot see and who refuse. God does that ultimately, but we are instruments of his service. Tonight I was asked to speak about Lee and Jackson, and it's kind of hard to combine these two when there are hundreds of volumes written on both of these men. But they are the quintessential essence of Southern patriotism, <laughs> godliness, honor and self-sacrifice. The types of men that we have not seen in our country for generations. And the types of men which we need desperately. There was a man one day, he was riding home from work, and he came to this large spanning bridge and underneath this bridge was just turbulent water and rocks. And as he got close to the bridge, he could see uh, the shadow, an outline of a man standing on the edge of that bridge ready to jump head first into the water and kill himself. He realized it, so he pulled his car off carefully off the road, got out as, as slowly as he could and moved toward the man as closely as he dared. And when he got up to him, he said, he said, Mr. Don't jump, don't jump. He said, I don't have anything to live for, I'm jumping. And so the man started thinking in his mind, what can I do to keep this man talking? Maybe I can get him off this bridge. He said, well, don't jump because of your wife and children. He said, my wife divorced me six months ago and I don't have any children. He said, well, well don't jump because of your, your family, your friends, your neighbors. He said, my family all hates me and I don't have any neighbors. <laughs> and on and on and on he went, well, what about your job and your future? He said, I've been, I've been fired six months ago and there's no hope for any more employment. I'm jumping. So finally, he came to the end of his rope, and a thought came to his mind. He said, well, don't jump because of Robert E. Lee. And the man turned around with a grimace face. He said, who is Robert E. Lee? The man put his hands up to his mouth and said, jump, Yankee, jump. <laughs> <laughs> But there's an element of truth in most bits of humor. And there is one in this one. Some of this has been said, but I think it needs to be reinterpreted and revisited. Because I do not want my children, my grandchildren, or my great-grandchildren someday turning face up to me or my sons and saying, Who is Rob D. Lee? And Amen. And who is Stonewall Jackson? The Bible uses the Hebrew verb zakar over and over and over again. You know how you remember that word? Where did I, how can I remember zakar? You know, you'll remember that now. It means remember. Remember. Over and over again. Remember the Lord your God who brought you out of the house of bondage, out of the land of Egypt. Remember the covenant I made with Abraham. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We need to remember because we live in a generation of humanists. We live in a generation of people who will take the Southern history and revisit it and revitalize it in the worst way possible. And as one of my friends, uh, Mr. Kennedy, said once, he said it is a supreme example of shrewdness to take one's own history and ancestry and turn it on you so that your children and your children's children despise the very thought of it. It really is propaganda, it's not history. Right. It's changing, it is changing the quotas of life, it is changing the ideological philosophies of what we live by and who we are. 
We are a southern people. We're not ashamed of our culture. We're not ashamed of who we are. And we're not ashamed of the God we serve. And when we come tonight, we need to remember that because our schools, all you have to do is open some of the textbooks that we find. Thankfully, there's some good people in the school systems. I'm not drowning everyone in one deluge here. But those ideologues who have rewritten history so that it becomes more propaganda than not have made us and made our children rethink who we are, despise us. Those people, revisionists, are those who would continue to, to blind those who follow us and to consign men like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson to the trash heap of history, if they could. It is almost, idol it's almost an idolatry to them uh, to stand in the position they do of centralized power and government, of subsuming everything under life under the authority of man. That is the bloody French Revolution of the 1789 character. That is the philosophical ideology of the Enlightenment in which man becomes God and worships at his shrine. These men did not believe that. And we would do well if we continued not to believe it ourselves. Because it's not only unbiblical, but it's irrational and it's contrary to wholesome, godly living. I think it is correct to say that a man such as Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, we heard about their dates tonight when they were born. One, one historian said, these men did not just happen in the annals of history. Their lives were a result of divine providence and generations of Christian ancestry. You cannot disconnect or divest the Christian faith of either one of these men and have the men that are presented to us in history. That cannot be done. You cannot sever the body and soul of them. It does not work. Lee was born of pure noble blood. The illustrious line of the Lees goes all the way back in history to Lancelot Lee, who accompanied William the Conqueror in 1066 across the Channel to England. Mm -hmm. He later on gathered a group of knights to go and fight with Richard the Lionheart against the Muslim invasion. And I'm going to say that's what it was. We need to go find him, <laughs> wherever he is. As you look at these two things, you'll also see that Lee's mother was Miss Anne Hill Carter, a long, a long line of family Carters, distinguished Virginians in the colonies. They were known for their charity, for their Christian faith, and for their willingness to serve throughout their communities. William Henry Lee, who was, we know, Major General Henry Lee, like Horse Harry Lee, Lee's father, told his son, and I quote, I would rather see you unlettered and unnoticed in virtuous in practice as well as theory than to see you equal to the glory of George Washington. In other words, I want a man of conviction, honor, and decency before I want a man who outwardly is shown and put appraisals upon by society at large. Nothing wrong with that. But he says it is better to be morally upright. Today we, I'm sorry to say, we have few men who are statesmen, but we have a lot of politicians. People who would sell anything to get elected and sell anything else to get re-elected. The two positions. Thank God there are those who are not. But that does happen. It happens frequently. Lee was born in Stratford Hall, the ancient home in Westmoreland County, Virginia, as you know. And we heard about Stonewall. He's over in Clarksburg, West Virginia today. I'm just going to still include him in Virginia. All right? Put him there. Leave him there. But he was born there on January, as we know, 19, 19th, on a Monday, uh, 1807. Interestingly, he was born at the, in the same room which three of his relatives were born earlier, in the same house. And he was born only 75 years away from the time when General George Washington himself lived. A long, a long and fruitful ancestry. I think we have to say Robert E. Lee was a man of Christian character, as was Stonewall Jackson. Stonewall Jackson was converted about 1851, became a deacon in the Lexington Presbyterian Church, and was the, I think, 974th member of that congregation. He became a deacon. And when he found out if you were a deacon and you didn't show up for the meetings and you stayed home, he'd get his hat, he'd go down, he'd knock on your door, and he'd say, sir, are you a deacon? Yes, I am. Why are you not at the meeting? Uh, sir, I'll, I'll, I'll be right with you. <laughs> get my hat, I'm going. He kept the Sabbath day holy. He did not even like to fight on the Sabbath when, when it was unnecessary. 
He did not like to send letters in the mail or collect mail on the Sabbath. He was a man of prayer so that those who walked by his house loved to just stop in and visit it at the evening time of Vespers so they could hear Stonewall Jackson hold their names up before the throne of grace. Amen. That's the kind of man he was. All his household gathered together. Lee was the same man. When he was visited by the chaplain, Reverend, Reverend B.T. Lacey once, he said, General, I want you to know that there are so many prayers of the Army having deep interest in your welfare. Some of the most fervent prayers offered by our chaplains are for you, sir. The old veteran's face flushed, his eyes filled with tears, as you know. And he said, please thank them for that, sir. I warmly appreciate it. I can only say that I am nothing. Nothing but a poor sinner trusting in Christ for salvation, and I need all the prayers they can offer in my behalf. We've heard plenty of generals say that recently, I'm sure. <coughs> we need some that do, more and more. Lee was what might be called a gentleman. A century ago, a gentle man was almost inseparable from the idea of a Christian man. A man's gentleness and a man's character and a man's public decorum were directly connected with what he believes. You cannot connect a people, disconnect a people or a culture from what they believe. If you're in Islam, you will promote Sharia law. If you're a Hindu, you run by Hindu law. And if you're the people of God, you need to look at God's law and God's ways. What you believe will affect how you live. It will affect it. It doesn't matter who you are. You cannot dissect your philosophy and your beliefs from who you are as a people. Lee knew that. Jackson knew that. It's, it, it's without contradiction. These men were men of Christian character. Douglas Southall Freeman, probably one of the greatest biographers of this past century, wrote a four-volume biography of General Lee. And he described Lee in this way. What he seemed to be, he was. A holy human general. And I say that H-O-L-Y. The essential elements of his positive character were two, and only two. Humility and spirituality. Field Marshal Viscount Woolley, who was a commander of chief of British Armed Forces, said, I have met many great men in my time. But, he says, Lee is among the ones who impressed me most with the feeling that I was in the presence of a man whose cast was of a grander mold and made of different, finer metal than all other men. He closed by saying, when Americans can view the history of the war between the states, interestingly, he used that terminology, with calm impartiality, I believe he will be regarded not only as one of the most prominent figures of the Confederacy, but as one of the greatest Americans of the 19th century. I think that can be said almost without any any uh, reservation whatsoever. Jackson also was a man who was, was of Christian character. He also was a great disciplinarian. One, one of his soldiers one time said, Reverend, Mr. Jackson is a disciplinarian. He said, if you don't, you, he'll discipline you at the drop of a hat, and if you don't watch it, he'll drop the hat for you. <laughs> he said, do your duty and leave the results to God. And that's the, one of the best advices we can give. Both Lee and Jackson, but particularly Lee, as the war rode on and he became the president of Washington University, later Washington and Lee University. Many people came to him for instructions, many people came to him to, to speak, but most of all, it seemed that those people who wanted his name and influence on their charters, on their insurance policies, and on anything they sold, they tried to get General Lee to sign on the dotted line. One New York life insurance company actually offered him $25,000 just to put his name on their policy. General Lee thanked him kindly and said he would not sell his name at that price, or any price. That was like a small fortune. Not bad even today, is it? It's interesting, too. The New York Herald, when the war was over, they, the Republicans were pushing forth George, Ulysses S. Grant for the presidency. And they didn't know whom to choose. So they looked around and they said, let's get some more Union generals. But the Herald, the New York Herald, came by and said, we recommend that they nominate General Robert E. Lee. This is in the North. The Northern people respected him, even though they, they fought against him. Let it boldly take the best of all Northern soldiers, said the Herald, making no palaver or apology about it. 
He is the better soldier than any of those they have fought upon, and he is a far greater man. He said Lee fought Grant to a stump all the way across the state of Virginia, his native state, with a fourth of the men, with less than half the supplies, and had he had enough, he would have driven Grant out of Virginia long ago. We believe, he said, Grant would have been beaten from the field of Virginia, and we believe Grant, General Lee could beat him in the field of politics if he was willing to run. This is the Northern newspaper. He was a sterling tribute to his character. Note and so that the issue goes on. We could say also something about his generalship. We all know that. Brilliant. Jackson's Valley Campaign, 1862, the spring. Marched nearly 700 miles. Defeat five armies. Captured 20 pieces of artillery, thousands of soldiers. Brought in all kinds of contraband and supplies. Losing less than 1,000 men. Killed, missing, or wounded. He walked these men to death, the foot cavalry, 16, 17, 18, 20 miles a day. And one man said to these soldiers, why in the world do you put up with that? He said, we put up with it because when he leads us, we win. We're willing to make the price because at the end of that sacrifice, there is a glorious victory waiting for us. Look at Chancellor's video where he was tragically shot. You walk by the camp of Jackson and you hear the men cheering. One old Confederate veteran said, when you hear the boys cheering, one of two things is happening. Either Jackson is riding through, or a rabbit has just run through the camp. <laughs> and if you're a Confederate soldier, rabbits were pretty important. <laughs> Not long after Southern Independence, General Winfield Scott <coughs> was asked by his associates, whom he considered the greatest general, and you know this, who do you regard as the greatest living soldier? He replied without hesitation, Colonel Robert E. Lee. He's not only the greatest soldier in America, he said, but he is the greatest soldier now living in the world. He went on to say, this is my deliberate conviction with a full knowledge of his extraordinary abilities. And if the occurrence ever arises, he said, Lee will win a place in the estimation of the entire world. And in many ways he has. He has. Lee fought. Lee fought with being outnumbered on almost every occasion. Lee fought with inferior weapons. Lee fought with a lack of supplies. And yet he made his enemies pay dearly on every account and used the most brilliant tactics that the world has ever known, as we heard today, even studying those up to the last few years, even regarding in the place and love of the respective men. Lee's men loved him, so did Jackson's. There were two different personalities, right? Two different locations, two different peoples, and nevertheless, as they were, God used them both in his providence. One well-trained, educated, more cultured. Jackson was fatherless at two. He, at the age of seven, he was without a mother, he was orphaned, and he was bandered around between members of his family, finally ended up in the military by the providence of God. Someone came to Jackson and said, he gave some thought of being a minister. And someone said, if God called you to the mission field, what would you do? Jackson said, I'd leave today with my hat in my hand. But God put him where he wanted him, and he did great service, both to the church and to the world and to the Army of Northern Virginia, to the Army of the people of God here. I do agree with those historians who say probably per capita more Christians in the Army of Northern Virginia than there were in the, in the, in the household of Oliver Cromwell's roundheads. If you were there during that time in the 1600s and visited Cromwell's camp, and it was done as he fought against Charles I and those who were wrestling against them, they'd go through the camps and they'd see Cromwell's men with their Bibles open over the campfire arguing theology, arguing the issues of what the Scripture says. And they complained and they, they asked Cromwell, why are they doing this? He said, he who readeth well and he who prayeth well, fighteth well. The people of God involved in these whole issues of life. There may never have been a commanding general in the history of the world who would have ever a bigger place in the hearts of his men than Robert Edward Lee. It's so interesting. Lee was riding along one time and he saw this ragged private. He rode up beside him. The man immediately took off his hand and stood in reverent attention as if the King of England had walked in, literally. And as he began to, row, to ride away, 
this ragged private, took off his hat and said, God bless Marsh Robert. I wish he was the emperor of this country, and I wish I was his carriage driver. <laughs> they loved him. The English would visit the, the campground of Robert E. Lee. It wasn't uncommon for a soldier to come up to Robert E. Lee and take off his hat and say, Howdy, Dad. And Lee would take off his hat and say, How do you do, my good man? And the British would just melt. Such insubordination. Such dishonor. But nevertheless, Lee's men loved him. And they were willing to follow where Lee led. His respect in the eyes of men, his respect in the eyes of his people, he was there. Upon the cessation of conflict in April the 9th of 1865, no more touching scene could be seen in this dedication than when Lee leaves the courthouse. And one of the most notable scenes in the history of the war. Some of his men replied, General, we'll fight him yet. The general says the word, all we'll do, we'll go after him again, General, just give us the word. Men were weeping, they were kissing his hand, his boots, touching his horse, traveler, doing anything they could to get near their dear commander. At Raleigh, it was a train station, was there. The women and the men of the Confederacy would come and they'd have their little children holding him up, and most of the little boys were named Robert or Robert E. Lee. They would have his name strapped on a piece of card around the little kids' hands so they could see it. Once in Florida, Lee pulled in on the boat, and the people so crowded the boat that they were about to tip it over, and the authorities had to push them back. And when Lee came out on the deck of the ship, hundreds and hundreds of men standing in front of the ship to a man from the front to the back took their hats off their heads and stood in silence before him as if it would have been blasphemy to say a word. He had the honor of his countrymen, even as, even as Washington had long ago. When you speak of respect, after the war, Lee's doctors, as he was suffering probably in one way from heart trouble, they advised him to go to a spa, a spring, hot spring spa up in West Virginia. So he took his daughter, they went in. That evening there was a large building like this in which people would come in and eat. And as Lee walked in the door with his daughter on his arm, he got a little of a shock because he looked out at the, all the surrounding peoples and every man sitting at the table had a blue uniform on. <laughs> General Lee just smiled. And all the Union soldiers' heads turned directly at Lee and stared at him. The tension was there. And all of a sudden, you heard the moving of furniture. And every man, every man in a blue uniform sitting at the table with his wife or daughter or sweetheart pushed his chair back, stood at full parade attention until Robert E. Lee and his daughter walked to their chairs and sat down. That's honor. That's respect. Whether you were on his side or not, you have to respect the man. I'm praying that God will in this generation raise up more such men, more men like them, because we're woefully in need of them, aren't we? When Lee was given the headship of the commandership of the Army of Northern Virginia, Colonel Joseph Ives, one of Lee's engineers, answered the question for Major Alexander, will this man be able to lead an army? He seems so gentlemanly, so docile, so easygoing. Will he do it? Alexander said, if there is one man in either army, Confederate or veteran, or Confederate or Federal, who is head and shoulders above every other man in sheer audacity, it is General Lee. His name might be called audacity. But his audacity was not rashness any more than Stonewall taking his, his whole corps around the Union flank through the woods, striking them at Chancellorsville when nobody was expecting it. Or Lee dividing his army in the face of overwhelming odds. Lee and Jackson both knew the mettle of the people they were contending with, they knew the psychology of those people. They knew their tactics, and they were willing to do that with the trust in God that they would make the benefit of that something to be remembered. <coughs> Calculated audacity founded on trust in God is the formula for holy warfare. Holy warfare. Doing one's duty both to Jackson and Lee was considered tantamount to being a soldier and a man of God. Charles Flood comments, that Lee's entire life was one long response to the call of duty. 
the call of duty. Lee's faithfulness was evidenced as a boy when he cared for his invalid mother. At West Point, no demerits, and became the head of that department. Later on, the head of the Army of Northern Virginia and then the president of Washington College. Incidentally, what kind of man was he at Washington College? The same kind of man he was in the field. Loved God, and someone asked him once, as the head of this college, what do you want from your students? I often think of that myself. And I don't think I could have said it better than General Lee said it. He said, I want that every man who passes through the gates of this institution to be a dedicated Christian. Our education is woefully lacking in the area of teaching morals and truth and Christian rectitude. So that when we get out, we don't just have our heads stuffed with ideology, some of which is either socialist, communist, or indifferent to humanism. But to have them talk line upon line and precept upon precept to fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Lee thought so, and he was right. While he was there, one young man got in some trouble. The students were to cut their own wood, pile it up outside their dormitories, and go out and get it every evening and burn it. One young man found out that some of his wood was missing every night. He worked hard to cut that wood, and every morning there was far less of it than he'd used, so he thought he'd set a trap. He took one of the logs, he drilled a hole in it, and filled it full of black powder, <laughs> covered it with mud, so it, you couldn't tell what it was, stuck it in the pile. So sure enough, that night, the culprit came along, picked up the wood, took it in, stuck it in his stove, and boom, nearly blew the sides of the stove out. Sad part about it, I think it was one of the professors. <laughs> <laughs> the news got around. General Lee said, bring that young man to my office. I want to see him right away. So you can just imagine the chagrin on that young man's face when he sat outside the door waiting for the hammer to drop on him. This is General Lee, and I'm in trouble. General Lee invites him in very carefully. He sits down. He says, "Ah, right, young man, tell me what the problem is. What happened? He explained it to him. But he said, General Lee, it was wrong for me to do this. I'll never do anything like that again. Please forgive me. Please let me get this right and start over. He said, Gen young man, you are right. This will never happen again, and it better never happen again. You go and do what is right and be a gentleman in this school. And as the young man turned to go out the door, General Lee's voice was heard over his shoulder. Sir, he turned around and said, yes, General Lee. He said, I have a bit of advice for you. He said, what is it? He said, next time use less powder. <laughs> <laughs> Very human. Very human. <clears throat> when you begin to look at the concepts of why Lee fought, why the South fought, the centrality of their faith, the centrality of the understanding that, there, that it is a government under law. Not change it as you will, not override it by some executive order, not recast it in a way that our ideology is, whether that is the truth or not, but standing by it. I think as well said, Lee put it this way, all that the South ever desired was that the Union as established by our forefathers should be preserved and that the government as originally organized should be administered in purity and in truth. That's what we're fighting for, not centralized eclectic government. My grandfather fled for his life from communist Poland. I have no use for communism. I have no, no use for socialism. I have no use for atheism and for those who promote it. And it was four years early before he could get his wife and daughters to this country. And he thanked God that he was able to do so. We need to watch what we believe, how we vote, and the ideology that we hold saying this is the country. Let's get back to our roots. Lee was right again. He said the South has contended only for the supremacy of the Constitution and the just administration of the laws made in pursuance of that Constitution. Virginia, to the last, made great efforts to save the Union and urged harmony and compromise. And yet that compromise was thrown in their faces, the desire for peace was ignored, and people were dismissed out of hand. 
His first shot was fired because the enemy was in the gate, and he either fired it first or you did in self-defense. That's the way it was, not the way it's been rewritten. Responsibility for the, war, for the war in Lee's mind rested on the radicals who had taken the government. If you look north of the Mason-Dixon line, you see Unitarianism, Transcendentalism, Deism, and any other kind of ism you can imagine. Remember in the 1848, in, in parts of the north, there were communist communes. I'm not making this up. Communist communes in 1848, plus all kinds of other radicalism that was going on. In the South, under that Mason Diston line, there was not only Christianity, but there was reformed Calvinistic Christianity that came from the Scots Irish and others who had fled to this country for their freedom and for their faith. And down here, they were looked upon as radical. We still are looked upon that way today because we believe the truth. It's not new. Look at it and compare it. You can say anything you want, you can believe anything you want, and you can almost get away with anything you want as long as you're not a Bible-thumping Christian. Amen. That is not tolerated. You can take your name, Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Jackson off your schools. You can take any desire for prayer in public or the public affection for Christ, and you become a radical. These men were radicals in the best sense of the word, as was the country that they had served. <clears throat> when Jackson himself died, there were 20,000 people who marched by his casket in Richmond with the flag as we heard draped over it. As the crowds were ready, as they were ready to close the casket that evening and dismiss the rest of the crowd, one of the old veterans came in. His arm had been shot off just, below, just above his elbow. And he wanted to see his general so badly. He was begging to see him. And they said, no, it's closed. Go away. Everybody has to leave. He would not be removed. And they thought they were going to have to call the guards on him. And finally, the old veteran lifted the stuff of his arm up in the air. And he said, by the right of my arm given for this country, I demand to see my general's face one more time. And he went over and just wept over it. These people were people of honor and respect and love. And when they died, they died in that same simple Christian faith by which they had lived. General Lee went home to be with his Savior on October the 12th, 1870. One historian said that three nights in a row before Lee's death, they looked up and saw the northern lights, which were not very usual at that part of the country, flickering in the sky. The old, the old the sages used to say, when you see that, something great has happened or some great man is ready to die. Some say his last words were strike the tent. Others de debate it. But nevertheless, tell him, he said, tell the general he must come up. He's going back to the old land of his army days. Miss Lee wrote a letter to a friend saying, General Lee has gone to his rest, and oh, what a glorious rest was in store for him. The Southern Khalid.